Welcome to sections 19.7 and 19.8. Okay, gentle people, section 19.7 is a really short section, and it just wants to introduce you to the idea of ligand field theory, which you explored later in upper division chem classes. I'm just going to give you guys a basic idea of what this theory is talking about. When we looked at crystal field theory, we looked at the metal ligand interaction in a very exaggerated way. We envisioned these bonds as ionic, when in truth, like we mentioned before, these are coordinated bonds. They have a naturally high covalency where the ligand is donating the electrons to that metal center. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to bring that covalency back. And to do such, we're going to go back to MO theory or molecular orbital theory. Now, what you guys might have remembered in MO theory, what I do is I take my atomic orbitals. So let's say that I have an atomic orbital of hydrogen and an atomic orbital of hydrogen. And with these atomic orbitals, I can mix them constructively to generate a bonding molecular orbital or I can mix them destructively to generate an antibonding orbital. Now, of course, you guys have electrons in your atomic orbitals. And remember, we're taking these atomic orbitals, we're destroying them, mixing them together, and the result is these MO orbitals where the electrons can go ahead and, be, and reside. And we can get to more complicated pictures, so you'll recall this from chapter 12. Here is the molecular orbital diagram for B2. Now what we can do is we can do the same for our complex ions. Now what ligand field theory is going to do, it's going to look at certain orbitals. Let's go ahead and say that I want to make this metal complex, and my metal has six ligands. So what I have to do is look at the atomic orbitals. Now, I'm going to have the metal on the left-hand side, and I'm going to look at the atomic orbitals that are going to go ahead and create this new bond. So remember, what I really want to look at is the valence orbitals. These include the 4p, the 4s, and the 3d. Now, I also have to consider the orbitals on my ligand. And again, we want the atomic orbitals. Now, I'm just going to focus on, on one of the orbitals that the ligand has. And this simplifies my picture. Since there are six ligands, they're going to use six orbitals to bond. And so now what I can do is I can go ahead and put these orbitals together to generate my molecular orbitals in the center, and this would correspond to my coordination compound. Now your book goes ahead and does this, and I'm just going to tell you, you guys don't have to worry about memorizing this picture. This is a very complicated interaction where I'm bringing a whole bunch of orbitals together to create this molecular orbital diagram. You guys will see the diagram here on the left-hand side. Now, what I want you guys to take out of this section are a couple of points. The first point is that, remember, I said we had six ligands. So that's six attachments, coordination number six, that is an octahedral structure. Now, what you guys will notice inside this molecular diagram, you might have noticed something familiar. And that's this picture in the middle. You'll notice two orbitals up and three orbitals on the bottom. If I wanted to go ahead and detail this picture a little bit more, those two orbitals up on top have a high amount of character of dz squared and dx squared minus y squared. In other words, the dz squared and the dx squared minus y squared is on top. The three on the bottom correspond to dxz, dxy, and dyz. And so, ladies and gentlemen, here's that first point, that if we use MO theory, it gets us the same desplitting that is predicted by crystal field theory. So both of these theories get us to the same conclusion. What's more in this picture this book provides you with 
is that if you change the ligands, what you guys will notice is the D splitting remains the same, two up top, three on the bottom, but the energy difference can change. So what this says is by changing the ligand, you are going to change the energy gap between the D orbitals. Now, if a theory predicts the same as another theory, that's well and dandy, but what we hope is that this new theory brings some more information. So here's the second point that I want you guys to note from this slide, that this diagram gives us a little bit more information about the nature of the orbitals once they have split. What you'll notice is that they label the top two orbitals EG star. Now, don't worry about the EG notation, but remember what the star notation means. When I star something in a molecular orbital diagram, what I'm saying is that those orbitals are antibonded. So it turns out that not only do I split the D orbitals, that the top two orbitals, the DX squared minus Y squared and the DZ squared, well, they're antibonding orbitals. Now the bottom three orbitals are something that we haven't discussed before. These orbitals are considered non-bonding. And what that means is that they are not bonding orbitals because bonding orbitals means that they bring the atoms together and it strengthens the bond if I populate these with electrons. They're not anti-bonding orbitals because because antibonding orbitals make the molecule not want to come together in a bond. It is unfavorable to put electrons in here. These are non-bonding, and that means that basically that these orbitals do not participate in any sort of mixing. We start with some d orbitals, and they are just left unchanged. They are at the same energy. Now, why this distinction is important is what happens when you start promoting electrons. You guys will recall that bond order is the number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by two. So if I were to take an electron and promote it through light to an antibonding orbital, well, that means I increase the number of antibonding electrons, which means that if I increase the number of antibonding electrons, my bond order is going to go down, or that means I'm going to weaken my bond. So what you guys will see in a lot of transition metal complexes is if you shine light on them, the ligands are going to start to pop off and you can exchange ligands. And so in this way, light can be used as a reactant. So with those two points, I'm gonna go ahead and close out section 19.7. Let's go ahead and finish off this chapter and talk about section 19.8. In section 19.8, what we are looking at are metals in biology. Now, metals have varied uses in proteins and biological functions. Here is a list. There's no reason to memorize this, but I want to show you guys that taking a little bit of transition metals are important in your biological function. You can see they're involved in a whole bunch of biological processes. But let's take a look at the complex ions they form. So one of the most ubiquitous ligands that you will find in nature is this ligand right here. This is called the porphyrin ring. This ring is an organic molecule that you will find all throughout nature. What you guys will notice about this ligand is there's nitrogens with lone pairs. And if this, and if this molecule were to lose hydrogens, these nitrogens would have lone pairs. What that means is that a metal can sit in the center of this ligand, and this ligand is considered a tetradentate ligand. It binds to my metal in four different spots by each nitrogen. So what I can have is a metal that sits in the center of this ligand. So if that metal that sits in there happens to be a magnesium, 
and these x's represent the variable structures we find in nature, what you guys will make is chlorophyll. If on the other hand, if that metal happens to be iron and those x's happen to be different kinds of biological structures, what you can get is this structure right here called heme. Now this might sound familiar to you guys. Heme is the stuff that makes your blood red. You'll find this structure in your oxygen transport system. Now my heme structure depicted right here isn't all by its lonesome. It actually sits in a bigger protein called myoglobin. And you can see the heme structure highlighted in red here on the right hand side and the rest and the rest of the protein made out of thousands of atoms. However, it is this heme structure which is carrying out the most important chemistry. You see what heme does is heme can interact with oxygen. So what I'll have is my heme interact with O2 and O and O2, what you guys will notice, has lone pairs, and that means it can act as a ligand. Now it turns out, if I have heme, which is an iron two plus in my porphyrin ring, and I go ahead and bubble in oxygen, I go ahead and do this reaction and oxidize it to iron three plus. People believe that this happens because my two heme molecules can come together and share an oxygen bridge, and this oxidizes my metal center. However, if I put my heme in my myoglobin structure, what happens is that simply that my oxygen is going to attach to my iron and not oxidize it. And so the rest of the protein is making sure that oxygen acts like a ligand and doesn't actually do any redox chemistry. Now myoglobin doesn't act by itself. What can happen is I can put four myoglobins together and we get the structure, and you probably heard about this protein, hemoglobin. Now hemoglobin has four of these myoglobins which have heme rings and each one of these heme rings with the iron inside the porphyrin can grab an oxygen. So what can happen is hemoglobin can grab four oxygens and those four oxygens become ligands in hemoglobin. Now this reaction is in equilibrium. When there is a lot of oxygen, like in your lungs, will the oxygens attach to the hemoglobin and you make the oxyhemoglobin. Now this oxyhemoglobin is gonna travel around your body and go to places like the end of your capillaries where there's not a lot of oxygen. And if there's not a lot of oxygen, well, the equilibrium goes back the other way and it releases those O2 molecules so that your body can metabolize them. This equilibrium of oxygen and hemoglobin transports oxygen throughout your body. Now, sometimes this process can be interrupted. For example, what you guys see here is the oxygen attached to the heme. Now, oxygen is acting like a ligand, but remember, anything can act like a ligand if it has lone pairs. A molecule that is similar in size to oxygen is carbon monoxide. What you guys will notice, carbon monoxide has lone pairs and it can act as a ligand. So what it can do is it can look for these heme centers in your hemoglobin and it can go ahead and attach. If that's the case, we have another equilibrium with carbon monoxide. Now the problem is, is this equilibrium is 200 times stronger than that of oxygen. So what happens is once that carbon monoxide attaches to your hemoglobin, it doesn't want to let go. And this is the reason carbon monoxide poisoning happens. The carbon monoxide attaches to your hemoglobin as a ligand and does not want to let go because the equilibrium is so far on one side. Now, once that takes place, your hemoglobin is effectively useless. 
it destroys the functionality of your hemoglobin and it is no longer able to carry oxygen. When someone is exposed to carbon monoxide, they are literally suffocating to death because they are unable to transport oxygen throughout their body because their transport system is blocked. I hope you guys found that interesting and remember Chem1C to stay safe.